Greetings, and welcome to the lecture on the history of the U.S. War with Mexico. There were multiple immediate causes of the Mexican-American War, but most follow from a powerful movement inside the United States to expand and fulfill its so-called manifest destiny to occupy the entire North American continent. There was a long history of U.S. interest in acquiring Mexico's northern provinces. In Mexico, worries about American expansionism had began even before Mexican independence from Spain in 1821, and dated at least back to since Napoleonic France had pressured Spain to return Louisiana to France, and then almost immediately sold Louisiana to the United States. The U.S. also claimed parts of Texas as part of the Louisiana Purchase, however, the borders had never been clearly defined. This changed in 1819 when the U.S. signed the Adams-Onis Treaty with Spain. The treaty had opened the Oregon country from the Louisiana Purchase to the Pacific. The treaty also transferred Florida to the U.S. and set the boundary between Texas and Louisiana at the Sabine River, its present location. On the southern border of Texas, the division of political authority was the Rio Nueces. South of there was Mexico. During the years after Mexican independence, Mexico, Mexico allowed and tolerated American immigration into Texas, hoping to grow the population sufficiently there to stand off Indian attacks. But Anglo-American colonists in Texas refused to either accept Catholicism or end slavery. John Quincy Adams made three attempts to buy Texas, and this effort to acquire Texas continued under Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson saw Texas as being in a similar situation to Florida before the Adams-Onis Treaty, as an invitation to and a magnet for foreign interests and intrigues, as well as a refuge for raiding Indians and fugitive slaves. Following this logic, Jackson looked beyond Texas to the Pacific Ocean, fearing that France or Britain would get Texas or California for payment of financial claims against Mexico. He also did not want Texas to become an independent nation that would cause trouble for both countries. On several occasions, Jackson's ambassador, Anthony Butler, whom one author calls possibly the worst diplomat in the history of the United States, attempted to bribe Mexican officials into supporting the sale. Jackson overtly repudiated this when Butler insisted on mentioning it openly, even though Jackson had clearly authorized Butler to proceed. Further afterwards, Jackson kept Butler in the position, where Butler carefully assembled a highly questionable dossier of North American claims and grievances that would eventually be considered as a cause for war against Mexico. In 1830, Mexico banned entry without a Mexican passport and banned the introduction of slaves into Mexico, essentially forbidding further American colonization of Texas. The effort failed as Americans continued to pour into Texas, including Jackson ally Sam Houston. By 1835, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna had made himself a dictator of Mexico, reorganized Mexico as a military state, and set about suppressing rebellions in regions that remained loyal to the 1824 Constitution of the Republic of Mexico. To this end, Santa Ana cut a swath of terror through the rebellious areas until only Texas defended the 1824 Constitution. Although whether this was out of loyalty to the Constitution or from seeking a pretext for independence is debatable. Santa Ana saw the rebel Texans as U.S. proxies. Andrew Jackson, surprised, declared U.S. neutrality. Mexican efforts to regain control of the province instead resulted in a Texan Declaration of Independence on March the 2nd, 1836. Massacres at the Alamo and Goliad inflamed the Texans, who, under Sam Houston, fought a war of mobility, stretching supply lines and scattering Santa Ana's forces. The decisive engagement came at the Battle of San Jacinto, in which the Texans defeated Santa Ana's forces in just 18 minutes and captured Santa Ana himself shortly afterwards. Texas declared independence on March the 2nd, and Santa Ana agreed to two treaties, one ending the war and the other recognizing Texan independence. 
Both treaties, however, were disavowed by the Mexican Congress, as they were considered invalid due to them not being negotiated, but rather dictated to Santa Ana while he was being held as a captive. John Quincy Adams contended that Jackson, by allowing recruiting for the rebels, transit of rebel reinforcements and supplies, and stationing a large body of U.S. troops on the border, many of whom deserted to join the rebels, was party to a conspiracy to promote the revolution in Texas. Mexico did not recognize the republic, but was powerless to change the fact of its existence. In Texas, Sam Houston, after being elected president in a landslide in his inaugural speech, strongly supported annexation by the United States, as did most of the population. However, it would still be another year before the U.S. recognized Texas. This was due to Jackson's demand for scrupulous adherence to all treaties and agreements in pursuit of his goal to have all foreign nations treat the U.S. with due respect. Given that the U.S. had given up all claims to Texas in the Spanish-American Treaty of 1819, unless Jackson could buy it from Mexico or Mexico would recognize the Republic of Texas, Texas was out of reach for the U.S. Thus, Texas's formal request for annexation by the U.S. was rejected by President Martin Van Buren, even as Texan independence was being recognized by the U.S., France, Britain, and Belgium. In spite of Texas's weakness, Mexico was unable to mount the sustained offensive that could have recaptured Texas, and Texas was able to maintain its independence. However, British and French interest in Texas continued to make Texan independence a threat to the security of the United States. After the death in 1841 of President William Henry Harrison after only a month in office, President John Tyler made the annexation of Texas a primary objective. His earliest attempts failed. After having an envoy recalled and a treaty of annexation rejected by the Senate, Tyler sent an agent named Duff Green to Texas. Duff Green was a prominent Democrat in Texas who had been both recommending and scheming to seize and annex the northern provinces of Mexico since before James K. Polk's inauguration. Green was worried about abolitionism and convinced that any purchase would be impossible, as any Mexican government that agreed to the sale of a third of the country would instantly be overthrown. Green then warned Tyler of British schemes in California and put together a plan to take the northern provinces of Mexico by force. Green's plan was to found a private corporation that would conquer the northern tier of Mexico by means of an army that he would raise, aided by 60,000 Indian warriors he claimed he could recruit. Any annexation of Texas would then include approximately two-thirds of the territory of the entire Mexican Republic. To this end, Green attempted to get a Texan charter for the Del Norte Company, whose function would be to start a war with Mexico that would justify the seizure of the targeted Mexican provinces. When President Anson Jones of Texas refused him a charter, Green then threatened to start a revolution in Texas. This threat led to his recall and an apology to the President of Texas. Green's failed attempt to bribe and then coerce the president of Texas and the public revelation of the, of the scheme caused it to collapse, and the U.S. government disavowed Green. The later Polk Stockton intrigue to have Texas start a war with Mexico, which would then justify U.S. intervention and the seizure of California, was a variation on this same basic plan. Meanwhile, President Anson Jones of Texas, perceiving that the Green Affair was just one more attempt in an ongoing U.S. policy to gain the territory Mexico refused to sell, pushed for Mexican recognition of Texan independence, which he believed would make Texan independence a more preferable option to Mexico than Texas being annexed by the United States. However, President Tyler continued to push, and on the last day he was in office, he sent instructions to have the House plan for annexation presented to Texas, an action the incoming President Polk allowed without comment. Polk's relationship with Mexico had two distinct phases. The first was characterized by Polk's willingness to buy Mexico's northern provinces, and the second by his willingness to take those provinces by force. During this first period, Polk was also sending agents into Mexico, such as William Parrott. 
In spite of the danger of his illegal status, Parrott set back regular reports on a wide range of topics in Mexi Mexican governance and affairs, including attitudes toward Texan independence and the activities of British and French diplomats. By September, Parrott had informed Polk that it was unlikely that Mexico would invade Texas or declare war on the United States, and Polk moved to reestablish diplomatic relationships by sending an emissary to persuade Mexico to sell Upper California and New Mexico to the U.S. for $40 million, with the border set at the Rio Grande to El Paso and then west to the Pacific Ocean. The mission ultimately failed because, as historians have noted, no government could sell half the country and still remain a government. James K. Polk then sent Archibald Yell to implement Tyler's plan, although he also gave Yell verbal orders, so highly classified that they were not trusted to paper. Meanwhile, Anson Jones in Texas had made a deal with the British and French to refuse annexation for 90 days to see if a deal could be made by which Mexico would recognize Texan independence and Texas would remain independent. Yell was followed by Charles Wycliffe, another secret agent covered as a private citizen, and together they started making promises, traveling throughout Tex Texas and working to build pro-annexation sentiment. The open ambition by the U.S. that acquisition of Texas had been a cherished American policy for 20 years precipitated acrimonious exchanges between Mexican and American diplomats. Vitriolic Mexican denunciations combined with Mexican failure to pay previously agreed to monetary claims caused some to recommend war, although, again, their motives can be questioned. Polk was far more aggressive than the previous administration, and this created opposition, as seen in the failure of John C. Calhoun to support Polk's push for war, or even a statement that it was caused by Mexico. Goals of the Polk administration did not include Texas. That was a fait accompli, an accomplished fact by then. Therefore, it is likely that many of the stated arguments and issues for war, like Texas annexation, protection of Texas from Mexico, and the boundary issues between the Nueces and the Rio Grande, were pseudo-issues designed to obscure the real goal, the acquisition of California. In addition to Yell and Wycliffe, a third agent, Robert Stockton, was dispatched in April. Stockton was a naval officer, an influential businessman, and one of the wealthiest men in New Jersey. He was flamboyant, unconventional, and adventurous. His grandfather, Richard Stockton, had signed the Declaration of Independence. He had financed both canal and railroad construction. As a senator, he fought against the regulation of steamboats on inland waterways. As an officer, he had made determined efforts to su suppress the slave trade, going so far as to seize French ships that he suspected were involved in the slave trade and causing diplomatic incidents, although he was not disciplined or relieved. He also support, supported black colonization efforts in Africa as a means of gradually eliminating slavery in the United States. Although he consistently supported the South when there was an attempt to use federal power to affect the holdings of slaves as property, as a nationalist he could not countenance succession, and when the break came he ultimately took a public stand for the Union. He also had a very con strong conception of Anglo-Saxon as a race and its inevitable destiny to conquer the continent, although Stockton's vision was not so limited as North America. To Stockton, any given boundary was fair game. This avid expansionist and extreme American nationalist carried orders to report to Commodore Conador, Com Commodore Connor in the Gulf of Mexico, yet explained his failure to report to Connor by writing him of his private instructions from the President. These instructions appear to have been to push Texas to invade the disputed area between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande, starting a war with Mexico and enabling the U.S. to come to the defense of Texas. Stockton's letter to the Texas Secretary of State explained the mission. Texas General Sherman would call out the militia, Stockton would supply them, and this force would then attack the city of Matamoros. 
This would start the desired war with Mexico, allowing t Texas to be annexed and create a pretext for the seizure of New Mexico and Alta California. This was essentially a variation of the Duff Green plan, with the Indians replaced by the Texas militia. At this point, as several historians have noted, if Stockton was operating without authority, it was time for his immediate recall and court-martial, neither of which occurred. At the same time, Texas Rangers working with Stockton reported a large Mexican army had taken up a threatening position on the border. This false intelligence was designed to force Texas President Jones to accept Stockton's plan, yet Jones refused to be bullied and insisted on having time to think about it, knowing that British envoys were on the way with the expected Treaty of Recognition from Mexico. When that recognition occurred, Jones announced it, issued a public proclamation of the settlement, and announced that there would be no war with Mexico. Jones then assured Stockton that he never had the least idea of manufacturing a war for the United States. It is noteworthy that Jones passed on the certain popularity and U.S. accolades that would have ensued had he cooperated, and ultimately paid a high price for his principled stand. Jones also wrote that subsequently the U.S. sent troops in to protect Texas, though there were no hostilities, to ensure a collision with Mexico. While Jones's action killed Stockton's attempt to start a war in the border region, it did nothing to divert pro-annexation forces in the Texas Congress, which both voted to accept annexation and reject the treaty with Mexico. Stockton, after reporting directly to the President, was transferred to the Pacific and promoted to command of the Pacific Squadron in anticipation of impending action in California. At this point, with the failure and revelation of the scheme, Stockton departed while Polk intervened directly, urging the ta Texans to attack the Mexicans in the contested area. Polk also defined the border as the Rio Grande, which thus included much of New Mexico, and presented that territory as disputed, when it in fact had always been Mexican territory. The area south of the Nueces had never been part of Texas. Stockton himself returned to Philadelphia and went on to call Jones's action treason and pushed again for what Polk had asked the Texans to do, to seize the area of Mexico up to the Rio Grande. After his departure from Texas, Stockton was harshly criticized by, among others, Sam Houston, who called him a two-penny fellow and a scoundrel that should be abated as a nuisance. Nonetheless, Houston, respecting the president, did not expose the scheme. Stockton's return to Washington was the end of the scheme to use the boundary issue, but it would be used again to actually start the war. Between annexation and the U.S. Army's movement to the Rio Grande two months later, Polk received an envoy from General Antonio de Santa Ana, named General Atocha. Atocha told Polk that if he returned to power in Mexico, Santa Ana would sell everything north of the Rio Grande and a line running from the Rio Grande to San Francisco for $30 million. Since the Mexican people would resist, the people had to see that the treaty was necessary to save Mexico from war with the U.S. To this end, Santa Ana suggested the U.S. Army advance to the Rio Grande and the Navy take up station off Veracruz. The scheme would also require a half million dollars, which was beyond Polk's ability to pay out of his contingency fund, and would thus require an appropriation from Congress. The problem then for Polk became how to gain the appropriation without re revealing that its purpose was to bribe Mexican officials. Citing the law that created the annual appropriation, Polk refused to reveal his discretionary expenditures while also giving orders that Santa Ana should be allowed to pass freely if he was found trying to enter Mexico. That same border region was the dispute when the war actually started the next spring, although to be fair, the first act of war was the American blockade of the Rio Grande, an act already claimed by the U.S. as a just cause for war if Mexico were to do it. In response to an ultimatum from Mexican forces, General Zachary Taylor first blockaded the Rio Grande and then sent a patrol into the disputed area. It was attacked by a superior Mexican force, overwhelmed, and either killed or captured. 
President Polk character, characterized this as the shedding of American blood on American soil in spite of having blockaded the river earlier. Abraham Lincoln called Polk's argument that Texas claimed boundary extended to the Rio Grande the sheerest deception. Ambassador Donaldson argued against any move, U.S. move into the disputed area because he was ignorant of Polk's real target, California. Polk faced heavy opposition, but control of the armed forces and the boundary issue kept him in control of the issue. However, Polk failed to avoid responsibility for the war in spite of his attempt to get Zachary Taylor to take responsibility, because Taylor declined to march without specific orders. Polk then changed his justification for war from Mexican non-payment of claims to claims of Mexican aggression. Through careful construction of the resolution, Polk boxed in the opposition. No one could vote against the war without being accused of not supporting the troops. Polk had his war. In northern Mexico, an information and commercial network up over a period of years was incorporated into Zachary Taylor's army. However, when the orders to march to the Rio Grande came, they were not in response to Taylor's intelligence, but to Winfield Scott's in Washington, who had his own intelligence sources and outstanding ability in managing the functions of intelligence. After General Arista crossed the Rio Grande north of Matamoros, Taylor sent a force to intercept, which was ambushed. Taylor then attacked and occupied Matamoros. An influx of civilian camp followers poured into Matamoros following the army, including prostitutes, gamblers, and liquor dealers, but also adventurers, predators, criminals, and thrill-seekers. They turned Matamoros into a hell of gambling, drinking, and violence. The promiscuity and confusion of morality, race, and nationality is emblematic of the problems the United States faced in prosecuting the entire Mexican-American War. Teamsters, mechanics, and wagon drivers also came into conflict with the soldiers, especially for things like selling water by the cup that they were supposed to be delivering for free. Also, they did not hesitate to plunder the dead, such as Arkansas Colonel Yell, who had earlier been Polk's envoy, whose body was plundered almost as soon as he fell in battle. The haste was due to several political factors, such as Polk's need to maintain a volunteer army, economic problems, and the need to capitalize on the temporary war fever. Polk originally called for 50,000 volunteers. Of the original rush, many were sent home after the three and six month terms were canceled by the army and 12 months became the minimum. The militia system was inadequate to the task. Militias were defunct, ceremonial, untrained or overly democratic. In many places, the militia system had proven itself inadequate to even controlling riots, leading some municipalities to scrap the militia system entirely and develop formal police forces. These were often brutal, arbitrary, criminal police. Efforts to reform the system ranged from abolition to expansion. Criminal underworlds and street gangs also joined militias that began looting and rampaging even before leaving for the war. Religious persecution of Catholics was common, in spite of the Catholic press being the only outlet that reported the leading role of the army. Catholics were often forced to attend Protestant services which featured insults and abuse of the Catholic Church, and discrimination made them more amenable to the appeals of Mexican Catholics to desert and join them. Very high levels of desertion in the army, especially over anti-Catholic bigotry, were responsible for such as the legend of the Irish soldiers of the Mexican army. Devastating losses due to desertion and disease, as well as combat, required severe measures to make up, such as forcing people to volunteer, press-ganging immigrant work crews, and mass roundups. The Massachusetts Regiment was raised in the face of a storm of protest. Upon departure, one Irish company refused to board the ship due to broken promises of payment and not having a chance to say goodbye to their families. After rum and false promises of money, the soldiers were allowed to meet with their families, then march to the ship at gunpoint. In the face of these processes, maintaining an all-volunteer force would only become more difficult the longer the war went on. So, for James K. Polk, speed was essential.
This poisoned the relationship between Polk and the professional methodical soldier Winfield Scott, ultimately leading to Scott's dismissal. Polk began to prioritize taking New Mexico as it was on the way to California. Command of the Army of the West was given to Stephen Watts Kearney, a competent officer and an ally of powerful Missouri Senator Thomas Hart Benton. The outbreak of the war saw the launch of two covert operations in New Mexico. One, led by George Howard, meant to collect information for the Secretary of War, and one led by James McGoffin, whose mission was to per persuade the Mexican garrison in New Mexico not to fight Stephen Kearney's invading U.S. Army. George Howard reported back that the people were amenable to terms, but that the government meant to fight, implying that Santa Fe would be vigorously defended. To reduce this possibility, McGoffin intended to bribe or persuade the governor to either depart or submit peacefully, and also delivered orders to Kearney ordering him, after taking New Mexico, to advance further west into California. McGoffin, after reaching Santa Fe, reached an understanding with the governor and lieutenant governor. Consequently, the Army of the West passed through New Mexico and entered Santa Fe unopposed. McGoffin then turned toward Chihuahua, meaning to perform the same function there, but with two important differences. There was no U.S. Army threatening an imminent invasion of Chihuahua, and word of McGoffin's actions in New Mexico had preceded his arrival in Chihuahua. McGoffin was immediately arrested and imprisoned as a spy. While in prison, McGoffin entertained lavishly, and this saved his life. Mexican forces intercepted a letter from Kearney to McGoffin, acknowledging his services in New Mexico. A Mexican officer took the letter to McGoffin and told him to destroy it if it contained anything incriminating. McGoffin burned the death warrant, but he was still held until the end of the war. After his release, his expenses were haggled over, even though McGoffin declined a bill for such items as nine months imprisonment. McGoffin ultimately accepted a reduced amount, $30,000, for making it possible for Kearney to take possession of all of New Mexico without firing a shot or spilling a drop of blood. As war began to look more likely, the unstated goal of seizing California became more pressing. Secretary of the Navy George Bancroft planned a covert operation with Missouri Senator Thomas Hart Benton, in which Benton's son-in-law, John Fremont, would extend his exploratory mission into California, and thus would preposition a military force inside California in case hostilities broke out. As Fremont headed west, Bancroft ordered the Navy to prepare for action in California in case of hostilities. U.S. Consul Larkin in Monterey was ordered to implement an operation that would acquire California in the same way Texas had just been acquired. Bancroft then sent sealed orders to Commodore Robert Stockton, ordering him to California to meet Larkin at Monterey. Meanwhile, Fremont advanced into California, intending to do whatever was needed to accomplish Polk's goal of bringing California into the Union. After the winter, Fremont continued his march until being first ordered out of the country and then being forced to retreat. Larkin's assistant Gillespie found Fremont and delivered mail and ver verbal orders, after which Fremont turned south and re-entered California illegally. The lack of written orders enabled the U.S. to maintain plausible deniability about Fremont's mission, even were Fremont to be captured or killed doing whatever was necessary. As Fremont was marching into California, war was declared. In order to establish his leadership position with the American settlers then, Fremont massacred several Indian villages along the Sacramento River, men, women, and children, which rallied the American settlers around Fremont. Fremont then worked to spark a revolution in California by designing an attack on the most important targets in Northern California, the horses and government officials, officials at Sonoma, which was captured in the middle of the night without opposition. On June 14th at Sonoma, after a brief battle with Mexican forces, a group of 30 American settlers declared California an independent republic. Fremont resigned from the U.S. Army to maintain deniability and then astounded a U.S. Navy officer who had come to tell Fremont that he was operating without orders by raising the bare flag. The officer was quickly relieved by Stockton 
and Fremont and his men were inducted into the overt military forces of the U.S. Stockton and Fremont together were a disaster. Stockton alienated almost everyone with bombastic, vicious personal attacks, brutish threats, and silly lies. Previously apathetic Californians rose against the Americans. With Stockton moving south from Monterey and Fremont moving north from San Diego, the Mexican Army of California left for Sonora or surrendered, and Stockton marched into Los Angeles, not only unopposed, but mostly ignored. Stockton exceeded his authority, establishing an improper government and proclaiming an illegal blockade of the west coast of Mexico. It is noteworthy that despite his disregarding orders from the Secretary of the Navy, Stockton was still not withdrawn, perhaps reflecting the same support from President Polk that had enabled Stockton to ignore his previous orders to join Commodore Connor off of Galveston. Stockton then cooked up a scheme to attack and capture Acapulco using privateers as an excuse, then march inland to take Mexico City from the west. After Stockton proclaimed victory, he turned over authority to, Fr to Fremont and sailed away. Afterwards, California exploded. At the same time, there were major disagreements between President Polk in Washington and Jackery General Zachary Taylor in the field over strategy. Polk, as an amateur, was concerned more with strategy, while Taylor, the professional, was preoccupied with logistics, understanding that the only strategies that can be implemented are those which can be properly built and supplied. Taylor's movement out of Matamoros caused a Mexican reinforcement of Monterey, which was then attacked from two directions with bloody street and house-to-house -house fighting. General Worth ordered a night assault that captured the Libertad Fort on the hill Obispado, giving his artillery superior position and securing the western approach to Monterey, while Zachary Taylor was still bogged down on the east side. However, after shelling, the Mexican position became untenable, and the Mexicans asked for surrender terms, which were granted. The Mexican army then marched out and retired, granting the truce in terms, while criticized, was considered a political calculation that might make the Mexicans more willing to negotiate and surrender in the future. Monterey was ultimately occupied the longest of any Mexican major city, and murder, rape, and robbery were committed by the Texas Volunteers in the broad light of day. It was the old catalog of atrocities all over again. The situation did not begin to stabilize until the Volunteers were sent back to Texas. Monterey was taken, but at a high cost, while other generals blasted Taylor's perfect inability to make use of information and called Taylor's army a huge body without a head. By the end of Taylor's campaign, nearly all the small towns from Matamoros to Saltillo were destroyed. In spite of Taylor's recognition of the need to limit violence in the conquered territory, lest it cause a violent backlash and make the territory ungovernable, his army still conducted itself with savagery caused by poor discipline, lingering hostility from Mexicans, from Texans toward Mexicans and Mexicans toward Texans, boredom, drunkenness, and the typical behavior of occupation troops, as well as criminal gangs of discharged volunteers and other criminals. The end result was a wasteland of ashes and dust and uncountable human tragedies caused by U.S. volunteers, discharged volunteers, gangsters, and civilians seeking revenge, irregulars waging guerrilla war, and regulars waging a counter-guerrilla war, all within a confined area. While Taylor and Worth reduced Monterey and Kearney consolidated New Mexico, in California Stockton's overbearing and despotic behavior provoked wide-scale rebellion, repeatedly forcing him to delay plans for the assault on Mexico City. Even Kearney, arriving in California, called Stockton's behavior cruel and shameful and empathized with the rebels. Had they not resisted, they would not have been worthy of the names of men. Mobs of angry Californians grew and coalesced into true insurgent forces. Gillespie, the governor appointed by Stockton, surrendered and was allowed to leave. Mexican forces then fanned out, capturing the Sonora garrison and driving the Santa Barbara and San Diego Diego garrisons to flee. By the end of September, Stockton had lost all of Southern California to Mexican counterattacks. Many of the administrative shuffles in Washington around this time 
especially of the Secretary of the, of the Navy, was intended to short-circuit criticism of Polk's conduct of the war and criticism of the war itself. To this end, Polk canceled Taylor's truth in the, truce in the Northern Territories, both encouraging Taylor's dawning political ambitions and bringing in an earlier nonsensical plan for an assault on Tampico back to life before Polk again canceled it on the advice of staff and shifted targets to Veracruz. Having decided that Zachary Taylor was his partisan enemy, Polk re reconciled with Winfield Scott and put him in overall command of the Veracruz operation. Polk then savaged his critics in language that quoted the constitutional definition of treason, causing both houses of Congress to explode in outrage and creating a debate that would continue for years, although Polk succeeded in eventually getting his war funding. At this same time, Stockton's initial efforts to recapture California failed, yet he refused to accept Kearney's off orders placing Kearney in charge of California instead of himself. The two butted heads from the day they met, and the reconquest of California remained incomplete. But in spite of their initial success and inspired flexible defense, what remained of the Mexican army in California was being outnumbered and steadily being ground down by lack of supplies and superior American numbers. Fremont negotiated a generous truth, truce with the rebel commander, allowing them to leave. Stockton and Kearney were both enraged. Stockton would have preferred a bloody vengeance for the rebellion. Fremont then aggravated relationships by siding with Stockton and refusing to take Kearney's orders, ultimately earning himself a court-martial. Meanwhile, regular troops began arriving and confirmed Kearney's authority. California administration was divided between Kearney and Commodore Shubruck, who then ordered Stockton to resume operations against Baja California and mainland Mexico. In preparation for the attack on Veracruz, Winfield Scott created a model for military government in foreign lands that was both constitutional and precedent-setting and consistent with the law of war. However, Scott did not properly prepare for large-scale guerrilla warfare, which may have created far less bloodshed, especially among civilians. Meanwhile, the, U the U.S. tightened its grip on California, even while Fremont continued to disregard Kearney's orders there. After Santa Ana learned of a transfer of ships from Taylor to Scott, who was preparing for the Veracruz invasion, Santa Ana moved to attack Taylor in his exposed position south of Satillo. Taylor deployed a, deployed a spy company of Texas Rangers and 300 cavalry soldiers. The Rangers scouted the Mexican camp, then reported back the size of Santa Ana's, Santa Ana's army at 20,000, or more than four times the strength of Taylor's force. Consequently, Taylor maneuvered away from Aqua Nueva and took a stronger position at Buena Vista, which would be the last battle of Taylor's campaign and where he won in spite of being outnumbered. Meanwhile, the geography of Veracruz and its heavy guns forced Winfield Scott to land elsewhere and mount a land campaign against the city. After a mostly unopposed landing at Calado Beach, U.S. forces followed the route of Cortez, which suited many of the, the soldiers who considered themselves superior people against primitives. Scott recommended a siege over storming the city once he had it surrounded, in spite of the need to take the city quickly before the disease season started. Scott built a forest of cannons and mortars around Veracruz and accepted the, the Navy's off, offer of additional artillery support from ships off the coast. After Veracruz refused to surrender, Scott began indiscriminately shelling the city, with what one historian described as a ruthless disregard and callousness toward the lives of innocents that remains inexplicable. However, after being offered terms of surrender that allowed the Mexicans to retain some measure of dignity, the garrison surrendered under generous terms of parole. However, this did not attend, atone for the shelling of Veracruz, Santa Ana declared. Veracruz calls for vengeance. A Mexico newspaper characterized the campaign in Veracruz as one intended to burn our cities, loot our temples, rape our wives and daughters, kill our sons, and sacrifice our defenders right in our presence at the doors of our homes. <laughs>
continuing opposition to the war in Washington, where it was widely considered an unjust aggression upon a weak republic, excused by false reasons, and continued solely for the acquisition of slave territory, made it absolutely essential for Polk to complete and consolidate his victory quickly, if all were not to be lost. After Mexico again rejected rejected peace terms, Polk decided to occupy Mexico City and dispatched a diplomat, Nicholas Trist, along with the mission, in order to facilitate a quick negotiation as soon as the Mexicans decided to bargain. Meanwhile, the Mexicans remained resolved to resist. Santa Ana, having raised yet another army, moved to restrict the U.S. to the coast. The resulting battle was a vicious bloody brawl of hand-to-hand -hand combat and intense musket and cannon fire, in which Santa Ana's defeat was so total that the invaders seized his personal coach. The disaster caused panic in Mexico City, yet also hardened the strength of the resistance, in which anyone who would even negotiate the U.S. was a traitor to Mexico. Within days, Santa Ana had built yet another army, and American officers were mystified that the Mexicans refused to negotiate, even though badly beaten and dispossessed of much of her territory. Guerrilla warfare erupted, especially after interim Pres President Salas called for a guerrilla army to wage a war of vengeance against the enemy, although social conservatism limited the effect of the appeal. Like earlier French elites, Mexican elites were afraid to arm the peasants. Winfield Scott's army marched from Mexico City on August the 5th, where Santa Ana had taken absolute power and was preparing to defend the four approaches to the city. After maneuvering to block Scott's approach, Santa Ana cut off three brigades around San Geronimo but lacked the unified command, experienced staff, and flexible tactical flexibility that could have smashed the Americans between two strong forces. Santa Ana redeployed to cover the withdrawal of his forces to positions closer to Mexico City. Scott then erred in advancing without scouting ahead. Under competent leadership, the initial American assault was shredded by the entrenched Mexicans and the follow-up reinforcements were driven back twice by heavier and accurate rifle and cannon fire. The division's artillery did not even get into action before the entire corps pulled back. However, Scott and Worth continued bullying ahead, and the weight of superior numbers and firepower eventually began to wear down the defense. Bloody bayonet charges broke the last of the Mexican defense of Mexico City. August 20th was the bloodiest day of the whole war. Scott's army could claim victory, but was in no condition to move into Mexico City. The Mexican defense had been gallant, stubborn, and deadly, and its artillery the equal of the Americans. The battle created an opportunity for negotiations. Santa Ana sent a message to Winfield Scott that he wished to negotiate an armistice, and Scott offered a truce. However, Scott and the diplomat Nicholas Trist did not understand that Mexico had no real federal government but merely con competing factions. Ambassador Trist felt sure that Santa Ana would negoti negotiate once he was safe from internal challenges, but Trist, Trist was wrong. Mexican diplomats continued to remain obstinate until September, when the talks finally ended in failure. After the failure of the talks, Scott decided to renew his assault on Mexico City, having never understood that Santa Ana had no real authority to conclude a peace with the United States in the first place. Scott's planning was again poor in that he again planned to assault a strong position that he had failed to scout out. His initial assault was again shattered, and had the follow-up been competently executed, General Worth's division may have been destroyed entirely. The general who refused to follow the orders to follow up, Alvarez, was instead harboring his forces for future domestic struggles. However, Scott's army was back in its old position by early afternoon. Meanwhile, in the city, the mass whippings and hangings and sadistic torture of deserters spread terror through Mexico City. After deciding on an approach, Mexico launched an all-out effort at the castle of Chapultepec and took and took, took it by storm after heavy shelling. Mexico's city's defense had been cracked, but the city had not been taken yet. 
However, with wealthy citizens hanging foreign flags and civic and social leaders mobbing Santa Ana with appeals to declare Mexico an open city which would spare it from destruction, Santa Ana recognized that further defense of the city would be useless without the support of the people. He gathered what troops remained and marched away towards Guadalupe Hidalgo. After resigning his presidency, Santa Ana split his forces, leaving one to harass U.S. forces around Puebla while moving with the other to block U.S. forces moving up from Veracruz. In Mexico City, after Santa Ana had abandoned the city, hastily organized bands of civilians held off Scott for two more days. And ultimately, it was guerrilla warfare, not the resistance of Mexican armies, that sapped the morale and resistance of the invaders. In places like Veracruz, suppressing the, pe the peasants took precedence over fighting the U.S. The landed elite, by and large, welcomed the U.S. troops as friendly to the interests of propertied classes everywhere. Scott entered the city and raised the flag, but Scott's grand ceremony had scarcely concluded when the city exploded in violent resistance. Scott unleashed draconian measures, summarily executing rioters and insurgents and destroying houses with cannon fire. However, low-level but deadly resistance continued. Scott had captured Mexico City, but he had not conquered Mexico. Polk, frustrated and angry, attempted to recall diplomat Nicholas Trist. Scott proceeded with the pacification of Mexico City and established an occupation government. After mollifying the church, at least superficially, the occupation of Mexico City went better, although thousands of U.S. forces died from disease, wounds, and assassination. Especially troublesome, as usual, were the Texas volunteers who murdered, robbed, and raped hundreds before being sent away from the city ostensibly to fight guerrillas. The tactics the army employed in the counter guerrilla campaign were meant to spread terror, just as they had when they had been used against the Comanches. Meanwhile, Trist, with encouragement from both Taylor and the Mexican foreign minister, defied Polk's attempt to recall him and further sent a 65-page tirade to Polk, denouncing him and informing him that he would not be recalled until he finished the treaty. While Trist negotiated in Mexico City, guerrilla attacks along the Veracruz Road continued, as did atrocities against civilians. Fighting amongst themselves, poor organization, and social instability hampered Mexican resistance, in spite of heroic fighting and some competent officers. After reaching a draft treaty and hearing British advice that the treaty was as good as Mexico was likely to get, President Peña, who had succeeded Santa Ana, signed the treaty February the 2nd at Guadalupe Hidalgo. Under the treaty, the U.S. annexed a third of Mexico, not including Texas. The U.S. paid Mexico $15 million and renounced all claims against Mexico predating the war. Santa Ana was given safe passage out of the country, while Nicholas Trist, who had negotiated the treaty, described the war as a thing every right-minded American should be ashamed of. Meanwhile, after receiving Trist's 65-page denunciation, Polk was sputtering in rage. However, he was caught on the horns of a dilemma. Polk needed a peace treaty, yet that required tolerating Trist's insubordination. If he didn't tolerate it, the peace party in Mexico falls, the Congress cuts off funding for the war, and the whole enterprise may have been doomed. After Polk's cabinet split over accepting the treaty, Polk sent it to Congress, where it was ratified, over the objections and votes of one faction, the All-Mexico faction that advocated conquering all of Mexico, and some Whigs who had opposed the war entirely. It was then ratified in Mexico in May. The vindictive Polk then blocked Trist's reimbursement for his expenses, and Trist wasn't paid until 1871, 23 years later. The withdrawal of the army from Mexico was messy, with the continuing depredations by volunteers, a persistent insurgency in Baja California, and Indian raids. Likewise, the discovery of gold in California created chaos and mass desertions among the withdrawing forces that landed there. Meanwhile, some forces were pushing for a scorched earth campaign to push Mexico to ratify the treaty. 
the last U.S. troops left Veracruz on August the 2nd. Total casualties ran into the tens of thousands. The U.S. took 529,000 square miles of land for less than 50 cents an acre. However, the U.S. made a miscalculation in its territorial demands. To build a railroad, the U.S. would still need more land from Mexico, and another war was politically impossible. At the same time, Texas tried to claim all of New Mexico east of the Rio Grande as part of Texas, and pro-slavery factions tried to short-circuit any establishment of an anti-slavery government in New Mexico. Mexico was in chaos with Yucatan secession, pervasive banditry, French and American border encroachment, and peasant rebellions, until finally suppressed savagely in the 1850s with U.S. help. This is the beginning of a long pattern of U.S. behavior in Latin America in which the U.S. supports the existing order against even democratic rebellions in the interest of stability. Widely held views in Mexico included those that the Mexican government had made peace with the U.S. so it could turn on its own people and that the elites had given up half of Mexico rather than give up their own position at the top of the social order. Civil war erupted in Mexico. Called the War of the Reform, this was an utter bloody chaos. Most of the financing for the rebellion was provided by Britain, France, and Spain. A French invasion was then defeated on May the 5th, 1862, but a second in 1863 conquered all of Mexico, a conquest that raised the countrywide violence to new heights. Before the Fr French withdrew under U.S. pressure, in 1867, about 300,000 Mexicans were killed. Persistent banditry caused the U.S. to regularly violate Mexican sovereignty. Under a regime of liberal authoritarianism, dictator Diaz invited foreign investment, which most Mexicans saw as selling out Mexico to the gringos. The later Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine saw the U.S. claim the right to intervene in the internal affairs of its neighbors, leading to U.S. invasions and occupations all over the Caribbean and Central America, the capture of Cuba from Spain, and the intrigue that created Panama, earning the U.S. a reputation all over Latin America as an international bully, the so-called Colossus of the North. While the characterization of the war as Polk's War is fair, Santa Ana's War is not, although Santa Ana did much to set the stage for the war through his bloody suppressions of the 1835-1836 movements, his many military blunders, and his self-serving leadership. Given that the contested area had never truly been subjugated and incorporated into Mexico's national structure, and that the Spanish and Aztecs before them had appropriated the area by force, how valid was Mexico's claim to begin, begin with? Given that the war was unavoidable, why did it happen? Mostly because of James K. Polk's ambition and impatience. Although Polk didn't really want a war for war's sake, he did try to buy the land first, then tried to force Mexico to sell with an escalating series of provocations before finally going to war. War, in this case, was diplomacy by other means. Americans were mystified at Mexico's refusal to quit, even though the dynamic mirrored their own revolutionary history, in which the Continental Army had lost most of the battles in the American Revolution, yet won the war by imposing unacceptable costs on the British and refusing to quit, even though defeated. There are other historical mirrors. The American effort to appeal to the minds and feelings of the Mexican people bears a strong resemblance to the Hearts and Minds campaign in Vietnam, which failed for many of the same reasons. Also missing or minimized in our historical memory is the record of brutality and atrocities. As one historian noted, the behavior of the United States Army in Mexico matched that of the mercenary armies of the late Middle Ages more than what was expected of a modern army in the 1840s. This level of violence produced the extraordinary lethality of the Mexican-American War. Of the forces engaged, the Mexican-American War produced a death rate of 110 per thousand, compared to the Civil War's 65 per thousand. The pervasive use of covert action in pursuit of goals and actions that could never be otherwise, otherwise authorized is also a significant legacy. 
with his use of secrecy to enhance his power, James K. Polk changed the rules in the relationship of the president to the people. Secrecy is anathema to democratic governments in that it makes it impossible for the people to meaningfully participate in political decisions. For a republic to function, the electorate must be knowledgeable and their elected representatives must be accountable. However, secrecy defies accountability and negates knowledge. As Polk took land from Mexico then, he also took power from the people of the United States. This certainly must be considered one of the longest lasting legacies of the Mexican-American War, along with the enmity between the two nations that has endured ever since.